Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to yet another episode of the Higher Line Podcast. Today is the 28th of May, 2022, just for posterity. I've got a friend on here, Chuck Haggard. You go you go by, uh, what's what's the nickname, the moniker you use, the something lawman? Oh, that's the one uh, William April inflicted on me. William April and Craig Douglas, the uh, first time we met at uh, TACCON in... Uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. <clears throat> I had the uh, Fu Manchu kind of Hulk Hogan mustache, and they decided that I look like uh, an Old West Marshal because I'm from Kansas, and that's where, you know, like Bat Masterson and Wyatt Earp are from. So William inflicted the label of the legendary lawman, Marshal <laughs> Chuck Haggard. And it, it stuck. It stuck. And, uh, yeah. I've had people think that I was, uh, you know, actually like a U.S. Marshal or Marshal was my first name. Just because uh, it got used so much. Yeah. <clears throat> he'd uh, he'd correct people on the Internet and they'd be like Marshall Haggard. And he's like, no, you have to use the whole title, you know, stop being disrespectful. And, uh, <laughs> he was such an asshole and I love him and miss him. That's so funny. That's funny. The, the, so he so then people probably just bought into it even more yeah yeah big time so on a serious note though you are a lifer cop what we want to talk about today you had written an article back i believe in 2018 about single uh single rescuer for an active shooter uh type of event right so i think it was actually i think i actually started that in 2008 okay so um, 10, 10 <clears throat> plus years beyond that one yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I, you ever notice anything and this is like gun world, tactical industry, whatever, whatever you think, man, I thought we were past that. And then you realize not everybody got the memo, mm. you know, um, <clears throat> like, like, like smoking's <clears throat> bad for you. Like something like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, the history of that was uh, just a little bit of my background. I've been in law enforcement for 35 years now, left my first job, 28 years, uh, retired there, was a tactical team guy for 17 years, firearms instructor, uh, patrol operations. I was our range master for about three years where I was responsible for all of our uh, firearms and use of force training. Uh, develop policy on a lot of things like, uh, you know, well, firearms, use of force, uh, when we got new technology and like tasers, things like that, I was the, uh, a member of, or the chair of our, our shooting review board, use of force review board for a long time. Uh, on the side, I'm a trainer for national law enforcement training center out of Kansas city. Uh, that's all reasonable use of force training, stuff you would have heard of like uh, LVNR, handgun retention, things like that, um, uh, Jim Lindell's uh, organization. And then I was also a trainer with uh, Stratagos International, which was a company that started from the original Surefire Institute that mm -hmm. Ken started. So I got asked to be an adjunct by Ken and I was helping out most of most of the classes I was helping out with was low light. Uh, it was law enforcement instructor classes or week long classes, low light and an active shooter response. And we did a lot of those post Columbine. My old bosses at my old job, of course, like law enforcement leadership, a lot of times is, you know, they're, they're way behind a power curve instead of forecasting problems they are way behind a power curve. After Columbine, the perception of what happened there was cops didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, the reality of Columbine was that there, there's a lot of mythology and BS uh, that people don't know exactly what happened. Like that was never supposed to be a shooting. It was supposed to be a bombing. And... and the bad guys screwed it up. Uh, just one example that a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, 
but at any rate, after that, our bosses were like, oh my God, we can't have that happen. So they wanted us to, we got to do some training. So we got to make sure that this doesn't happen. So I got charged. I was, I was a uh, team leader on the SWAT team and we did a lot of the tactical training for the whole agency. And I got asked to come up with a program. And initially, looking at best practices, things like that, we went with what a lot of other people were doing, which was uh, kind of that four man diamond uh Four, four dudes show up, you go in, you go after the bad guy, movement to contact. And some of the tactics would be analogous to uh, a hostage rescue, which, you know, it's kind of the same thing or there's kind of some similarities. If you have a traditional, like somebody takes a hostage, then the SWAT team surrounds and the negotiators are talking and things like that. Well, what happens if the bad guy starts shooting hostages? Mm. you go you have to mm. go you have to one of the things you do is you set up an immediate reaction team with as many officers as you have when when you have a barricade in case it goes south and then as more resources show up you you continue to improve your situation as far as handling it tactically but initially if you have a hostage job you might have like a few officers or a couple SWAT guys or whatever and they got to be ready to go as a rescue team just in case um so if you take that concept or that philosophy, you apply it to active shooter, uh, hostages or victims are being actively killed. Got to go, got to do something about it. So working with Stratagos, doing a lot of training with them, we would uh, scale our uh, training up to uh, some very large agencies would have a, uh, you know, a big dog pile on a target pretty quick. Like in my county, if we had a shooter incident occur, you'd have 30, 40 cops at 100 miles an hour, you know, uh, response time, you know, people showing up in one, two, three, four, six minutes. You, you have a lot of people. So one of the things we did was work on follow on tactics. How do you just not get into each other's way? Mm -hmm. And then the flip side is we like I did some uh, training uh, Storm Lake, Iowa. And when we're talking about, we used to do the instructor class, we'd be like, okay, if you have four guys, this is the standard. What if you got three? What if you got two? What if you got five? What if you got 10? And the Storm Lake guys were, they're like, man, uh, I'm it. I'm the Lone Ranger. And then, uh, you know, Bob will show up from the sheriff's department. So we'll have two guys uh, if it, you know, okay, that's, that's their reality. So I learned to scale tactics and, and we started. Let me just jump in real quick for the listener viewers. What you're saying is that there are thousands of rural places across this country, and you and I know tons mm -hmm. of these guys where they are it. There's nobody else coming unless somebody gets out of bed, pulls their pants and gun belt on and drives over. I've got friends, even within where I last saw you up in Wisconsin. Uh, when you came up to the range in Racine and taught, there's tons of little departments around there where they've got five guys and there's one dude driving around town looking for trouble at night. And that's mm -hmm. all there is. So that's just so you guys listening know what's what he's talking about. There's not eight guys waiting in cars and in alleyways to get a call. Yeah. And if you look at, I forget the gross numbers right now. So, um, <clears throat> You know what what's accurate like the right now but uh there's something like 10 12 000 agencies in the united states and most people think of cops they think nypd lapd mm. chicago because that's that's all the people have the uh the the tv shows you know mm -hmm. there's a lot more places that are like longmire mm -hmm. that that Absolutely. So uh, I forget the exact stats, so I might be off on the numbers a little bit, but if you average it out, like NYPD had something like 46,000 cops the last I knew, LAPD, it's got 10,000, but all of the smaller departments, when you, when you average things out, the average police department in the United States is somewhere between like five and eight people. Mm, I believe it. Yeah, that's what they that's what they got. So my, my wife and I were up in Brian Head, Utah, a couple years ago, which is like this beautiful little tiny ski resort down in the, the bottom quarter of Utah. And we got stuck in the snow and the guy that come to pull us out. Actually, we got to ride back into town to the constable's office 
And the guy that came out was a tow truck driver. He was also the firefighter paramedic EMT for, for the community. And he was the lonely officer and of course, tow truck driver, like, you know, rescue guy. So he did all those jobs in this community of like 500 people or something. He was like the one Jack of all trades guy. Yeah. Good, good for him, you know? Um, so, okay. So, uh, we, we would scale tactics, things like that. And, uh, a couple, so during my career, when I, when, when I was with Topeka PD, uh, during my time there, we had four active shooter incidents, none of them tra traditional that you would think of because none of them were a school shooter. So what, like when, in your opinion, or definition what does an active shooter mean like in your brain so people understand what we're talking about so let's see if uh, these incidents uh fit what people think because a lot of people think of school shooter or something like that right uh one of the incidents a guy was thrown out of a strip club very very angry about it came back with a gun uh shot the doorman shot the backup doorman shot one of the bouncers and then shot the bartender and then started randomly shooting people in the bar and was looking for club owner. Uh, I, I think that counts as an active shooter. He, he's going in to shoot like all the employees in the business. Just pissed off, wants to hurt whoever he can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we had one, there was a guy that was going to be, he knew he was going to be sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. And so he went into the federal courthouse here in Topeka uh, and this guy planned, he made a car bomb. Uh, he was a bad bomb builder, so they didn't go high order, but he made a car bomb out of his car. He made a bo car bomb out of his pickup truck, parked the uh, pickup truck at his county sheriff's office at the county next door, drove to the federal courthouse in Topeka, parked his car as a car bomb in the underground parking, went upstairs, wearing a suit and tie, carrying a briefcase, and had two handguns and a bunch of pipe bombs. You would think of it was like an IED hand grenade. And he started shooting people and throwing bombs on the building. And uh, so the the way they were designed, they were supposed to go off when they impacted. So he's throwing them like over the balcony into the atrium, except so there's there's exploded bombs or unexploded bombs all over the building. He went into an office suite that he thought was the judge he was angry with. And, uh, but he got off the elevator on the wrong floor. Uh, this was obviously way pre 9 11 because they didn't, you didn't have metal detectors to get in the building or anything like that. So he starts shooting up the office suite. Cops are showing up. He starts blazing rounds out the window at the cops. Um, we didn't know, but uh, what the culmination was is he had an, uh, you've heard of an ND or an AD. Well, he had an AB, accidental bombing. Mm. Uh, one of the bombs that he had stuck in his waistband, pirate style, went off and uh, blew him up. Uh, so he was laying there probably thinking, man, I really hate when that happened. And <laughs> he, uh, he, he shot himself in the head. So uh, picked up the gun, shot himself in the head. Uh, <clears throat> and with all that chaos, it took us a little bit to figure out that he was really down because the, the appearance of the office was there were, there were people leaning against the glass of the door. It looked like it had turned into a hostage barricade for a little bit until we figured out. Because even the people in the room didn't know he was down, right? So They're even, probably not going, hey, where's the bad guy? Let's go check on him and see how he's feeling. Yeah. Yeah, there was uh, like one lady was hiding under a desk and she had a shard of uh, pipe bomb shrapnel that was about this long. And it literally like went through her, like into her bicep and was sticking out the other side. Like, Was this from the one that detonated on him? Don't know, don't okay. know. One, one, I mean, there was, there was crap everywhere, right? Okay. So I think that counts. That's kind of an active shooter incident. Uh, the other one I personally responded to was what it was actually pre Columbine and it, we didn't even call things active shooters. Like it didn't have that label, like the federal courthouse thing. We didn't call an active shooter. That was like, like a post Columbine thing. Yeah. So I'm on routine patrol 
and we get a call fairly standard to start out with domestic. So you got X, she moves in with her parents and we have a lot of large Victorian homes around here that uh, uh, sometimes they get chopped up into apartments because they're so large. And, but this was like, a, I don't know, two story, five bedroom, that kind of thing. So, and uh, it's a Hispanic family. So they have a, a lot of extended family living there. So the ex moves back in with her parents. Uh, parents are there, ex is there, kids are there, cousins there, sisters there, a couple other people. Uh, so the call is the male half, the the estranged, I forget if he was boyfriend or husband at this time, at this because it's been a while, um, is at the front door and he's trying to get in. So that kind of thing happens all the time. Well, then he starts kicking the door. And then, uh, so I'm like maybe a couple blocks away. And as I'm pulling up, the dispatchers tell me they have shots fired on 911. So I'm thinking, you know, I, fairly early in my career, brand new SWAT guy. I'm thinking kind of like, oh man, I got to, you know, what, what am I going to do? Uh, and then, the decision was instantly clear and made for me when the female, the female half's mom. So it would have been like grandma for the babies that were in the house. <clears throat> okay. She comes running out the front door and she's holding her face like this. And there's arterial blood squirting between her fingers. Not good. And she's screaming. He's killing the babies. How how you know, old were you at that point? I don't know. I was in my twenties. Okay. Uh, so, uh, like, if I'd have had a lot of the cool guy stuff, like my active shooter kit or a carbine in the trunk or any of that stuff that we didn't have back then, uh, I wouldn't have had time to get any of it. I basically uh, pulled my pistol, ran across the street, got up the stair because it was a big Victorian porch like traditional porch up the stairs across the porch. And I was thinking the whole time, <clears throat> you know, uh, best case scenario, he's not going to see me coming and I'm going to burn him down. Worst case scenario, he's going to see me coming. I'm in a 50, 50 gunfight and we're going to have to slug it out. And I was feeling pretty full of myself because I was shooting USPSA at the time. I'm wearing body armor. He's probably not. I had a brand new, very cool Smith and Wesson uh, semi-auto pistol with a lot of bullets in it, um, and uh, so I was just going to I was just going to press on this guy as hard as I could, as fast as I could, because uh, you can't, you know, he's killing the babies, not on my fucking watch, um, and I actually broke the plane of the door. Or I was breaking the plane of the door. What a lot of people would think of my angle because I was moving was kind of uh, slicing the pie ish. If you know, you just keep moving. So, you know, my view into the, into the room or into the house was starting to open up, you know, and uh, I saw him and I, re I remember this term from, I stole it from Ken good uh, the, the hunter versus victim mindset there was bodies at the guy's feet and he's got a gun in his hand and he's like scanning, like he's looking for who's next and he sees me and he recoils off my muzzle, like visibly his eyes got big and he was very startled and I'm pressing to get a muzzle on this guy and he ducks out of my view. Uh, and I hear this, you get that auditory exclusion i heard this just like tiny little pop and uh when I, I press and i'm trying to get view on this guy so i can shoot him uh he had shot himself in the head he just like ducked around a corner and smoked yeah, himself uh, he just just stepped like he stepped deeper into the room because there, there was like a doorway and there's like a vestibule and another kind of doorway thing um you know, I was a little focused, so like some of the surroundings are a little blurry in my memory, you know. Uh, but he, he, but he, he, he shot ahead. himself. And then, uh, so I look, he had shot the ex, her dad, both of them in the head. They were both laying there dead. 
uh, apparently he had tried to head shoot mom and the bullet ricocheted and didn't get into, didn't hit the brain, which, you know, that's a good thing. And we know pistol bullets do that. Um, so I did a sweep and I, I did a high speed sweep and clear as much of the house as I could. Um, I looked and both of, both of the babies, like one of them was like a toddler, um, absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, mom has flopped over on the couch and they're hugging her legs. Mom's obviously dead. Uh, check the house, uh, but like sister and cousin, and I forget, there was a couple other people, but I forget what the relationship was. And we're all like hiding in bedroom closets and things like that, hiding under the bed kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm utterly convinced from the, uh, the body language of this guy, things like that. Like he had shot those three people and it was like, where'd everybody else go? So if I hadn't have got there when I did and I hadn't have pressed what I pressed, he would have found them. You know, uh, he'd probably been to the house before, probably knew the layout of the house, probably knew, you know, where the bedrooms were, all that stuff, being, being an ex, you know. Um, and then looking at the psychology of that and then networking with a guy named Ron Borsch out of uh, Ohio. He's a big, big advocate for uh, solo response. Well, he was pushing solo response and then um, people were like, oh, you know, that's crazy. Officer safety. You got to have backup, yada, 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 yada. So we were I was having a discussion with Rich Grassi, who was the editor of the TAC wire, tactical wire where that article's published. And he asked me to write the article. So I just kind of it was just kind of like my train of consciousness. And if you look at the history of these things, the vast majority of them that are interdicted with a low body count in a timely manner are a resolute solo responder, be that a cop or an armed citizen that presses, tactically presses the bad guy. Because once you put tactical pressure on the bad guy, they tend to uh, give up, commit suicide, or if they want to shoot it out, which is which is more rare, actually, if they're tied up with you, they're not able to rove around and kill innocent people. So the more tactically, the more tactical pressure you put on them, the faster you can do it, the lower the body count's going to be. There's some there's some uh, anomalies in there. The Pulse nightclub thing was just just an absolute worst case disaster shit show mm -hmm. how the club was laid out the the lighting and just everything about the place uh the ingredients were there for just a complete shit show um and then how many people like how many people piled into the bathrooms and then were just you know fish in a barrel when the guy was hiding in there yeah uh, and then the cops couldn't like it, it was a, a masonry building or concrete building. They couldn't get bullets on the guy. And, you know, they eventually had to explosive breach to, to get that guy taken out, you know, mm -hmm. but what I'm talking about is in general principles that we apply. Uh, I'm a big believer in solo response, put pressure on a bad guy, keep piling the pressure on until, until you get it over with. Um, you know, ironically, what I'm looking at I'm 35 years of law enforcement experience I've been uh, I've been the good guy post 9-11. Everybody loved first responders post Rodney King. Everybody hated the cops post George Floyd. Everybody hates the cops. Um, now, I mean, in the past few days, uh, we we've uh, have we come to the opinion that we want cops to shoot bad guys because it sounds like we want cops to shoot bad guys, you know. But in, for the past two years, any any time a cop is using force, it's oh my god, and they shouldn't have done it, and why didn't you taser him in the big big toe? Mm -hmm. Why didn't you de-escalate as though that were somehow the force that Jedi's use? You know, I'm going to put some de-escalation on a guy. <laughs> uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a SWAT cop down in Arizona, and a pretty skilled dude i think he said that they've done over three thousand breaches in his time on that team so he's you know he knows a little bit about it and he said something about de-escalation too like is it uh, do people not understand that shooting somebody in the face is de-escalation i'm de-escalating the situation depending on like what's actually happened it might not be like like you said like hey man can you just stop what you're doing it might be 
a freaking bullet in the brain is that well, sometimes uh sometimes the only legally morally ethically you know everybody's now I, i'm seeing all over the internet everybody's like oh the you know the pigs and they're worthless and well, i'll point out in this last uh this one we're all talking about now it was a cop that ended it well the cops didn't do anything it was a cop that ended it mm -hmm. uh you know there's there's i don't know six hundred thousand cops in the united states um they're they're not one we're not the borg it's not a composite you know homogenous entity of humanity it's it's you know all shapes and creeds and colors and everything else uh it's human beings unfortunately we have to recruit from the human race uh so we don't have terminators or perfection or you know uh, what whatever it is people think they want mm -hmm. what i do note lately is everybody wants andy griffith until the really bad man shows up and then they want that guy to magically morph into robocop or the terminator and solve the problem mm -hmm. there there's a problem with that kind of mentality yeah uh, when you were talking about de-escalation, when I was talking at, at Columbine, if you were the first officer through the door of the library <clears throat> and you saw the two bad guys standing in the library in the middle of a pile of bodies, which they were, and they're holding sawed off shotguns, the only legally, tactically, morally, ethically thing you could do is shoot them both in the head absolutely as fast as you possibly can. There's nothing, there's no other decision to be made. Mm -hmm. uh, and if people, people often want to act like that, that really doesn't exist. Well, th this last one, this one down in Texas, the only legally, morally, ethically, tactical, you know, uh, answer to that problem is get rounds on that guy as fast as you can and mm -hmm. end it. End mm -hmm. it. Uh, there, there's no, there's no other that every other choice waiting around negotiation everything else it just it tactically poor and it's morally reprehensible and in it some kinda, cases it's cowardice it goes against logic like uh we we don't treat any discussion on topics of violent criminals uh with that logic we understand williams work that they don't think like we do, that the logic and reason, well, if maybe if we reason with them, they'll stop. Maybe we just want to talk about getting them a helicopter and getting them to an island or whatever the bullshit, you know, narrative. Yeah. It, they're not there murdering children so that they can have a conversation and go have a tea party. They're, they're murdering children. Yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. So, uh, you know, really, as far as, you get people that the cops should never do this. You never do all, all these absolutes. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I throw out, I've been throwing out for years. I've seen it uh, back in 2012. I had two of my officers murdered on a car stop, mm. uh, just regular suspicious car stop. Almost lost a third officer on that one. Turned into a rolling gunfight. Guy was just a psychopath, meth head, had already been involved in a shooting. And during that car stop, he knew he was a shooting suspect, but we didn't know he was the shooting suspect. So when they asked him to step out of the car, he thought, oh, they, you know, the gig's up. Um, shot two of my officers in the head and killed him. Wow. Uh, there were some issues, some, some tactical issues, things like that, but murdered two of my guys. My chief at the time's response after all the funerals and everything was to cut our firearms and tactics training in half. What was the logic there? What was his? Or there, is, there is no logic. Uh, it's always in the police department. People always talk about the cops need more training, the cops need more training. The cops agree. What's the first thing that gets chopped out of the budget in the police department? Training, training time. Well, we can't take people off the street to go to training. We, you know, we're going to do this like on, check the box online training what most departments do is they do not get their officers to proficiency they get them to the point that they can argue in court that they trained the officer to protect the agency from liability so that they can then throw the officer under the bus by saying well we trained him and then he screwed it up
mm. or she screwed it up. You know, so, I think that's a big misconception the public has about a lot of things, government related, um, not just law enforcement, but we assume everybody in the not everybody, but the public by and large thinks cops are gunfighters and can do all kinds of shit they see in movies. Just like if you meet a Green Beret, you think he speaks 12 languages and can freaking make a bomb out of shit he finds in a kitchen, right? So it like let's talk about this a little bit. You've talked about some of these stories that happened over a span of decades. And I think I this morning I was looking at something online. People that I know and respect posting things like um these officers should sit in prison the rest of their life. And some of these guys are even cops writing this. And I'm not a cop apologist. I think people should be judged by the merit of their deeds. But what's mind numbing to me is people expect that in 48 hours or 72 hours to have all the facts. I remember uh, Columbine, people are still analyzing data from that event. I forgot the sh- city southern california a handful of years ago dude goes into a uh like honky tonk off the highway and starts shooting it up and it was an interesting read uh because some cpd cops had just pulled somebody over off the interstate and were in the neighborhood and somebody saw their squad and ran to them so there was like somebody from the sheriff's office showed up there were a couple people from cpd and i think a couple people uh I'm sorry, from uh, the California Highway Patrol, CHD, and then uh, uh, somebody from like a local PD. And it ended up between these three or four rescuers, one of them shot the other one. I don't know if you remember that story. but Yeah, I do. That was a, that was a really kind of an ugly, friendly fire incident. Yeah, it was uh, shitty. And a couple of these guys had combat experience overseas. I mean, it was a just a plain accident guy fell in the doorway the other guy retreated and it was putting rounds through the door on the bad guy and the guy that had been hit got up into the incoming fire from the other officer i wasn't talking about it to critique it but it took years several years for all the data points to kind of get put together for somebody to paint a picture on paper where you could piece the facts together into a semblance of what actually happened because that each of the officers there had their version of what they saw, which anybody that looks at anything like this knows everybody's opinions, only what they saw. So anyway, I want to comment on that a little bit. Like folks are, are tearing this apart and people are saying, like, I'll get messages. Like, how are you not condemning these guys? Cause I don't know what happened, you know, and I'm not, I'm also yeah. not spending my life absorbing what the news says happened. I'll wait. In six months or a year, some report will come out. Like you said, George Floyd, 99.9% of the U.S. population never read the report that came out of that investigation or the stuff that happened with George Zimmerman or you name any of these highly sensationalized instances. Or sometimes it's suppressed. Let's talk about, uh, remember Ferguson, that disaster? Sure. Um, Hands up, don't shoot. That was fabricated. That's a lie. Never happened. Yeah. When you're talking about viewpoints, things like that, when you're in traffic and you're doing a traffic accident investigation, uh, old salty sergeant, when I was a rookie, when he talked about the importance of measurements and scene documentation and things like that, part of what he mentioned was skid don't lie. Skid don't lie. People might say, oh, he ran the red light or he came from it or this happened or that happened or they perceived what happened. But skid don't lie. Skid doesn't uh, make up a story. It doesn't uh, see something that didn't happen. So your physical documentation of the scene is super, super important. So it's, so he was talking about like the skid mark from the tires or whatever mm-hmm. data was left behind. Yeah, there's so people think of skid like somebody peeled out, leaves a skid mark or they hit the brakes and they're sliding. Well, there's different kind of yaw skid, skip skid. There's different kind of skid. You analyze the skid. You can get a point of impact on the street within inches. Uh, You can tell who is going how fast. There's all kinds of data you can get, Hmm. whereas people either by perception or by dishonesty 
might not give you an accurate account of what happened. So I, that always stuck with me, skid don't lie. And I apply that to all physical evidence, right? Um, I once had to help investigate an officer involved shooting thing that happened. It was kind of embarrassing for the department. What the guy perceived happened, I'm looking at the scene, the bullet holes, the angles, muzzle blast, things like that. I'm like, dude, this this was like, it was a disaster Um and it, it was just bad. And then we, we had to, we had to do some internal things, uh, disciplinary action and things like that to, to deal with that problem because, uh, you know, skid don't lie, uh, with the officer's story because he was so, uh, you ever heard the term, uh, I just, I don't know where I stole it from, but, uh, condition black, it's like an addition to Jeff Cooper's sure. color codes. Yeah, you're, you're, you're in, in the police world in a lot of places. When I talk about condition black, you're just you've lost it. You know, you're panicked. Um, you're 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 in panic mode. You're not taking care of business. Uh, it's just a bad place to be, you know. So the, the officer panicked is what happened. And his perception of what happened is not what happened. Um, but go back to the Ferguson thing. You know, what, what's one of the, every time you have a police shooting, what's one of the things people talk about? Well, you know, why didn't the cop shoot him in the arm or why didn't the cop sure. shoot him in the leg? Well, uh, most people don't know in this case, the officer did shoot him in the arm several times and that did not slow him down. The whole, why do we know the hands up, don't shoot was a lie and it was completely fabricated because weeks later, because it takes weeks to get DNA out of the lab. Uh, we have the, or we're inflicted with this uh, uh, CSI TV show mentality. People think you take your DNA, your sample, you put it in a computer, and like five minutes later, you got a reading. It takes weeks in a lab for a specific DNA, a specialized DNA scientist to match DNA. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then it's still not always perfect, too. Well, one of the things I never uh, saw reported was uh, when Michael Brown uh, was one of the bullets that went through his arm came to rest inside the driver's door panel of the police car, went through his arm and then into the inside of the driver's door of the police car. So what does that tell us? He was like inside the car. He was waist deep through the window in the car. Now we have an officer with a broken orbit around his eye socket, et cetera. What can we surmise from all this? He really was inside the car, giving this guy like a V-cast style beat down and he's shooting to save his life, shoots him in the arm several times. And then with recoil climb, one of them hits the guy in the head and uh, he's fatally wounded. That is so far from hands up, don't shoot that, that, you know, we're not even in the same universe, but, it takes a while for the forensics to confirm what the two the competing stories are. And then you have people actively lying about things, stuff like that. And then um, by the time that all comes out, the narrative is so entrenched in the public's mind that there's no turning back. Well, and people are so prone to Jedi mind trick. Hands up, don't shoot was just like, epidemic in our society for a while social media uh ball players coming out with t-shirts they're they're coming out on the football field with their hands up um you know bullshit like that you look at the uh you look at the oj simpson trial i'm utterly convinced that the jury at the point that uh the 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 little mantra that started getting repeated if the glove don't fit, you must have you quit. Must have quit. Yeah. You, the glove, glove don't the glove fit. Don't, you must have quit. You know, it's almost like a, like they got hypnotized. Yeah. Um, no, that's not what that means. Salesmanship. Yeah. Uh, so people are so, it's like our attention. One of the things the internet and the social media has done for us is like, it's like everybody's got ADHD now. Nobody has an attention span. Nobody knows how to read anymore. Everybody goes to Google and takes your first two or three hits on Google where you're being manipulated by Google. You're being fed what Google wants to see you. We know that in the political realm. We know that uh, there, there's algorithms so that they feed you what they think uh, 
you should be looking at, not the whole story. So and people choose, you know, people choose. Just looking yesterday, just parsing through comments across the internet, people sharing narratives of uh how does this kid have a seventy thousand dollar truck? Well, I just took one look. It looks like a two thousand five wore out F one fifty. That's not seventy thousand uh, dollars. Yes, it was. Okay, uh, you know, like mine. So, 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 let's just say it was a seventy thousand dollar pickup. Can a young man not get a car loan these days? I know lots of lenders that want to give people loans for freaking lots of money, to, and then they give them thirty percent interest rate or whatever. How do you afford the guns? There's about 9,000 ways for a person to come up with a few thousand dollars. And I even saw people that like, I saw people from, you said range master, people that I've met at that event. And they like spelled out uh, name of the gun, $2,200, magazines, $500, ammo. And like they wrote like a, like a receipt. Like, how do you know any of that? You, 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 I mean, like, yes, we know like what ammo costs and crap like that. How do you know his grandparents didn't give him five grand for graduation last year that he didn't the kid had a job you can make 500 bucks a week flipping burgers like it's just it's just people are stupid and they jump to conclusions and fabricate stories rather than just like it's it is it's a i'm not telling this to this to you i'm just talking about it in general like if the cops there didn't know what they were doing let's just say they didn't and they were all having like a a moment of trying to sort it out that's exactly what the world's doing, looking at too much information, trying to figure out what's right and wrong and what to do and just kind of arguing in circles and not doing something. I don't know. Keep keep going. Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> I, I don't even, you know, I've learned to, there's so much bullshit. There's so many trolls on the internet there are, you look at the Ukraine thing, some of the war reporting, mm. uh, there are people, uh, uh, like, I know there was a, a bunch of like, look at this Ukrainian soldier having to tell his uh, wife goodbye to go to the front. And then somebody posts, well, that's a scene out of a movie and you check, Oh, it's a scene out of a movie. Uh, you know, there are people who are actively, I didn't see that. Was it actually a scene out of a movie? Yeah. Yeah, it was. It, it was like a Ukrainian film, but most Americans don't know that because we don't have like, you know, a lot of Ukrainian films that end up over here. You know, there was a photo of a woman in her probably 60s with her head wrapped. It was like a really nice, um, nicely done photograph. It looked like something you would have seen in Time magazine. You probably seen it. She's got blood running down her face. She, you see her teeth. And you, it, it's like this picture like, oh, that could be my mom or my grandma. And like, I got to help her. And and then there was like a caption like woman's family dies in Russian bombing, blah, blah, blah. And you started to see after a couple of weeks of this thing going around the Internet that this was a real picture. It was a real person. It was a war torn environment. But it was like six years ago or some shit and it had nothing to do. But like some newscaster shared it and attached a, And then we just spin the stuff up. Uh, there, so I, there's, there's just like trolls. I don't know people that sit in their mom's basement that have nothing better to do, but, um, you know, they'll get bored and go through YouTube and like dislike everybody's videos just to do it. You know, mm. people who fabricate stuff just to troll people just because, you know, they're douchebags. Oh, it's going to be funny. Uh, you got, you actually got professional actors out there, you know, the Chinese and the, and the Russians are, are deep into the internet and misinformation and stirring up crap in other people's countries, not just ours, but, uh, you know, all over the place, you know, professional paid people who are, who are trolls. And then you got the news media. So during the Ferguson thing, I actually did some bodyguard work for uh, CNN. That was an experience that was educational. I got to watch firsthand while CNN reporters created propaganda from scratch hmm. it, it, it was interesting um looking at ferguson you remember like the videos and the things like that uh you know how big a, how big a swath of the city do you think that was i mean you probably think ferguson looked like west bay you know blocks and blocks and blocks were burned down right no it was like 
three or four buildings in the space of about a block. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, how many police cars do you think got burned up? Like all of them, right? No, it was it was one police car, like literally one, and mm-hmm. it was out of town. Uh, skinny little white dude activist that uh, came in and firebombed the car. Mm-hmm. So what they did was when the car was was burning, they had the car parked there, and they'll get a camera angle from here and here and shows here, all the burns around shit. the clock and the burning buildings as many camera angles as they can get. <clears throat> and then the aftermath: here's the burn up police car in the daylight. Here's the burn up buildings as many angles as many angles as many angles as you can get. Then when a talking head is talking about Ferguson, they, they always have the whatever in the background, right? Uh, So talking heads talking about Ferguson, burning police car in the background. Well, every time they throw that up, they will use a different camera angle. So it gives the impression that like, man, they burned down the whole city and all the police cars caught fire. Yeah. That I literally watched them fabricate that. And then like, Famously, Don Lemon, uh, the, the cops were using uh, rag control agents. He had a gas mask. Uh, he ran, he, he took his gas mask off and ran into the cloud to tear gas himself and then came out and get on camera all like, you know, eyes dripping, snotty, things like that. What does that give you the impression of? Oh, my God, look, the, the, the cops are like tear gas in the news. It's just mayhem. Everybody's getting it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that was like literally when I first showed up for that and I'm looking around, um, after the initial riots in the daylight and you wouldn't like, like when I was up there, uh, leaving the range at Racine, I'm driving through Racine and there was parts of Racine that looked way worse than, uh, Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're expecting West Beirut or, you know, Syria and you're driving around like, I, I don't, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, you know, where this event occurred because it was mm-hmm. just so compact. I've got a friend that was a copper down there at that time. And we talked about what you're talking about right now. And it's, it's um, people forget it's incumbent upon them to parse information. And then we, these same people that cry out about all this misinformation are the same people that keep reading and viewing and consuming the misinformation, like just stop, just stop doing it so we were talking about the uh police uh the police training thing stuff like that and i have uh you probably heard some of this like idpa guys uspsa guys people that are that are serious shooters which we know are a small subset of the shooting uh public um and they'll bitch about how cops can't shoot and i'll be the first to tell you a whole lot of police qualification courses aren't even a good sobriety test to steal a uh, line from tom gibbons and it's true the the standards like in my state i'm embarrassed at the minimum standards for firearms qualification but the fact is the vast majority of the cops it's that shoot to that minimum standards certainly vastly outshoot most of the concealed carry people that i've seen actually go through the course and i think you know but now that we have constitutional carry we have people that never even do that mm-hmm. uh, but my point is, is that I will ask some of these, well, cops can't shoot and they shoot blah, 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 blah. Uh, and I'll ask, have you ever contacted your elected representatives and tell them that you want an emphasis to be placed on police training? You want resources, you want budget. If it's range, obviously you got to have ammo, uh, whatever. You know, have you, have you contacted your representatives to let them know, I want my cops to be trained mm-hmm. well to a high standard? universally I get, you know, somebody with an open mouth and the answer is no, everybody talks shit. Everybody runs their mouth. Nobody actually does anything. Like I'm going to get a hold of my elected representative and let them know this is a priority for me. Mm-hmm. I think that, you know, we need to have well-trained cops and we need to have, you know, etc. One of the big things, you know, uh, that the anti-cop people are like, well, you know, we need the cops need more training. And then what's the next thing they want to do? Defund the police. Right. It, it, that's that, that's two different things. Yeah. Um, and so a, a law of like physics of the universe rule is you get the cops you vote for. Yep. 
people were like, well, what do you mean? And like, like, well, you might actually vote for a sheriff. So like Broward County, when they had that whole fiasco at the school down there and, and, you know, the SRO that didn't go in, things like that, massive failure in law enforcement leadership there, just cowardice and incompetence, massive mm -hmm. failure. But why was that guy the sheriff? Because you elected, elected him. him. You directly <laughs> elected him. And then people will point out, well, I don't pick the chief of police. No, but your mayor, or your city council or whatever exactly. form of government you have, your city manager, somebody picked that dude. And I've seen this in action when I was a staff level officer at my old job. <laughs> if the city council, senior city councilman or councilwoman or the mayor or whoever calls up the police chief that day and says, hey, you need to make this a priority, then guess what happens? They make it a priority like mm -hmm. that day. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've seen, you know, this, somebody complains to the city council person, city council person, uh, bitches to the chief, and they'll complain about stuff like uh, there's people speeding uh, through the school zone in front of my house. So bam, next morning, there's going to be a cop car there running radar. Mm -hmm. That's how that works. So if people were to complain to these elected officials and let them know that my my needs, my wants, you work for me and this is what I want you to do and I want well-trained cops, that might become a priority. And that mm -hmm. police chief, whether he wants to or not, will have to assign resources for that. Also, the, the elected representatives, the police chief doesn't set the budget. He's not the guy that, that says, hey, we're going to spend this much money on training. Your elected representatives do that. Yeah. So if you don't, tr what it what it eventually boils down to is, if you don't like your police, it's your fault. We we just had a conversation yesterday. This is something that I talk about often, as often as I can. We the people are a republic. We are members of this republic, and people often will say to your point about a sheriff. Well, I didn't vote for him. Yeah, but by your inaction to help the other guy or gal get elected, it's it's not just show up and cast a ballot. It's a organic process that is continual, and there's no just check the box. And even people that say, well, I did my service. I was a cop. I was a fireman. I was a soldier. No, no, you did your service in that capacity. It is a continual process till you die if, you're, if you take what we have here seriously. Uh, the conversations about city council, uh, co county boards, or whatever you have in your community. Uh, it is so easy to affect change in those things. Not easy like you just flip a switch, but like if 10 dudes in a neighborhood got together and they were half of halfway uh, decent intelligence and said, hey, our, our city council sucks. They don't care about the safety of our children. You could within one election cycle put in a new mayor, a bunch of city council people. You could affect who the police and fire chief were. You got fire boards and things like that. But it's really not that hard. It's just people don't do the work. You come home, you want to watch TV, you want to play ball in the backyard, cut the grass. It's a, it's another law of nature. And one that I talk about constantly with people is he who does the work gets the prize. And it's that and that alone. So we're so we're so ate up with bread and circuses, man. Mm -hmm. Bread and circuses. You know, why? Why did the Romans fall that because they, you know, they got fat, dumb and lazy, quit carrying. They farmed out their work to you know, we're not going to have a professional army anymore. We're going to hire these barbarians because we can hire them on the cheap. Uh, and then bread and circuses, that's all they gave a shit about instead of giving a shit about being good citizens and uh, running a republic. Mm -hmm. you know, so then now we don't have a Republican foreign government anymore. We, we have a king, a Caesar uh, or emperor, as it were. Uh, but you know, the, the biggest problem in America that I see is most Americans are just really crappy Americans or poor citizens. Uh, like here, our last mayoral, you know, the, the midterms get less attention, but our last mayoral election, 18% of the registered voters voted. So 18% of the city uh, registered voters, which isn't the whole population of the city. Right. They're they're the people who uh, made the decision who our new mayor was. So uh, we have a metro area of like shit. I forget now. Uh, I don't know, hundred seventy thousand people, and there was like four thousand people voted. 
Mm-hmm. And it's, it's in the defense of the public. It's hard to be interested because politicians have become basically what the news is. It's like, if, oh, I'm going to be a, I'm going to run for office. You almost and I've I've run campaigns for sheriff, state's attorney, uh, Congress, state rep, judges. I know these people. It's almost without fail. After a couple of months or a year, these guys or gals just fit this mold of, you know, thank you. And, and they got this like uh, the the job becomes to get reelected. I've got lots of people that I helped that I called them and said, what the f- happened to you, man? You know, like we were supposed to do something and, oh, you don't get it. Now that I'm here, there's like this whole process. I've got to no, man, do what we elected you to do. And it, it it's hard for the public to give a shit when the, instantly this these people just fall in line. And I don't think it's a conspiracy. Government's so big. It's hard to get in there. It's like being at the wave pool at a water park where there's just a million bodies and the waves are crashing around and like it's hard to see up down sideways or or have a thought or or hear a clear voice in the the fray. So mm-hmm. in the defense of the public, people that are running need to be people of integrity, I guess is a good way to say it for me. <laughs> I uh you know, there's, there's that whole like man in the mirror concept and you know, what, what you want to change. And uh, I I like to say, be the lack of bullshit you want to see in the world. It's a good way to say it. You be, be the lack of bullshit. Uh, Yeah. If, if nobody calls the mayor of the city council, then nobody, nobody calls start somewhere Yeah, you feel that way, do it. Uh, You think your cops can't shoot and, and it's a bad thing. You need you need to make a phone call, write a letter. Uh, fact is, is that uh, hardly you know I've literally asked that question hundreds of times and I've never got a positive response. It's always just pissing and moaning and talking shit on people and mm-hmm. then not actually doing anything. Um, people get on Facebook and make crappy posts, make a meme, whatever, and then it, it gives them this you know, quick dose of serotonin sense of, uh, uh, of, you know, accomplishment. And then they're off to bread and circuses. Uh, it's just, it's utter bullshit. Uh, okay. as, as we know in the training industry, most people aren't willing to do the work. Say, say that last part again. I said, like we know in the training industry, when we talk about training seriously, like JITs okay. or uh, you know, working out or shooting guns or whatever, most people are not willing to do the work. And that, that applies to like, you know, working with your, holding your elected representatives accountable as well. It's, it's interesting how many of us put the flag out on our porch or um, talk about liberty and freedom and an American dream and in and, and, and the history of this land, but aren't willing to do all of the things required to make it and keep it existing. So, um, you know, the, like the most pared down version of that liberty is life. And if we're not doing the things to keep little people safe, and I don't, I don't like I don't want to diminish what just happened in Texas in any way, shape or form. But I think at the same time, people are forgetting that there's kids killed every day across America by gang violence. There's kids killed by drunk drivers. I had a school teacher as a kid. She had two daughters, both killed by a drunk that crashed into them when they were teenagers in a car. That shit happens so much. Like, should we, outlaw alcohol and i'm not trying to make a fallacy argument where i say one's better or worse but we see these things that and i'm not preaching to you but just in general talking we see these things that are so horrific because we can't imagine getting a phone call that our kids were shot up by a rifle and then you know some weirdo that came into a school but we can kind of understand somebody crashing into them and running them over we can kind of understand uh some other calamity that happens enough that we're used to it we don't not that we accept it but like it doesn't cause us this achy visceral response where we're pissed off for days we just oftentimes say 
I don't want to think about that. That's horrible. I just think it's horrible. Maybe I have a bad thought for a minute and say a little prayer and then I, I move on. Where shit like this, man, people are, they lose their minds. It also doesn't get the coverage. If they were to, <clears throat> you know, there's something like last night, look, something like 60, 65,000 traffic deaths a year. So if they reported, uh, you know, kid got killed in a car wreck because drunk driver, somebody was texting, whatever. Uh, they'd be reporting on that like every single day, multiple times a day. That 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 would be the reality of it. Well, that's that's not not how the news works. You know, mm-hmm. they want the drama. They want, uh, you know, they want the advertising dollars, the internet stuff. What what do people talk about? You know, uh, if if it's good clicks or bad clicks, you're still getting clicks. That kind of mm-hmm. thing. Um, so part, part of it is what gets reported is also very, very skewed. So like kid killed, kid killed by a drunk driver is going to be a local news thing. Nobody else is going to hear about it. Another one that comes up often gun related and people, I, I post on this. I think I've read stuff you've shared. I know Claude Werner does is kids getting access to mom or dad's gun and accidentally hurting brother, sister, mom, dad. I'll share stuff about that in the response I get from gun people, you know, don't tell me how to store a gun or the only good gun is an accessible gun or uh, whatever, you know, some quip or like some, some dumb thing like, all right, man, you have this gun to protect yourself. Now your kid just killed his brother. Like, like that, that's, that's not a good outcome, but people, People like I, I t- every time I have a class, we talk for a minute about safe storage of guns just because I I don't know why it always comes to me. And I tell somebody, grab your phone, just Google. And I just give them a phrase and it's made up on the spot. Uh, kid shot mom's gun. And you'll find like instantly, like we could do it right now. You'll find a story that happened in the last week somewhere mm-hmm. where a kid put his hand in a mom's purse or dad's glove box or whatever and gun related. So it's not supportive of, of uh, any gun legislation or anything like that, but it, it's just telling of what people think in this space and, and, and how, what they're willing well, to accept. That, and that's very much, uh, you know, the Sandy Anna, he who ignores history is doomed to repeat it thing. Concealed carry culture, th- this isn't, I, I mean, it's a modern thing the way we're doing it now. Yes, but if sir. you go back to the 1880s, 1890s, 1910s, there was a robust and very common concealed carry culture. If you look at the types of guns, like the, you, I know you know the the little like Iver Johnson and the H&R. And the I've, got, I've got a couple of those little, little 32s <clears throat> and stuff, yep. Yeah, so you look at like the Smith & Wesson lemon squeezer. It had the grip safety, double action only, brake barrel. Well, part of the advertising was that that gun was very hard for a child to fire. Why would they advertise that? Mm-hmm. Why, would that be, why would that be a feature? Why would that be important to people? Because all of this has happened before. Uh, kid finding a gun in mom's purse. Kid finding a, a gun you know, in the uh, dad's desk drawer or in the car. Nowadays, it's in the car, uh, whatever the case may be. We've done all of this before. We've done all of this before. We've learned the lessons. We took measures to fix the problem. And then in inter- intervening years, the concealed carry culture kind of went away. Mm. And then it came back and we are relearning from scratch all the same bullshit that were lessons learned in blood a hundred years ago. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Uh, I, where I live in Illinois, we were the last state in the union to pass some type of concealed carry legislation in this modern age, which was just 10 years ago or so. Um, growing up here, we have a FOID card. So it's a superfluous ID to... Yeah your driver's license and shit just to be able to buy ammo or buy a gun. Only a few States have that. So growing up here, you just, uh, you know, you, wherever you live, you kind of think that's like the rest of the world if you don't travel and such. And like most States concealed carry laws as they were passed or discussed in state houses, always it would come out, Oh, there's going to be people shooting each other over parking spaces and all that kind of nonsense. 
but it was so hard for people to imagine a world where moms had guns in their purse and dad had one on his hip because it just went like you said it just went away for so long so Mm -hmm. like is that part of the problem people need to do we need a bunch of pain to sit down and look at this shit clearly i i don't know i i I don't either um i know that we're we're really really short-sighted we got really short-term memory problems you know like people are people are banging on the gun gun control gun or drum right now but you know, I put a lot of study in this because you know it was just something I did professionally, and you know this responding to an active shooter is not an academic subject for me. With my experience, uh, you know, I, I have a I have an emotional connection to this stuff. But you look at the history, like uh, the worst school massacre in American history was a bombing that occurred in something like 1910 uh, outside of 9/11 the worst mass murder in New York City history was perpetrated with a gallon of gasoline and a milk jug. Uh, So the when we're arguing about the means and the methodology were, you know, a lot of times we're picking and choosing and cherry picking the history and the facts around the dynamics of this stuff. and then people want to, they want a quick emotional fix. Oh, well, this can, this can never happen again. We can never have, so we're going to do this thing. That thing is not going to solve the problem you think it's going to solve. It's mm-hmm. to go. It seems like the common, and to bring it back to the active shooter, active murderer discussion, just parsing the internet, the public opinion is, hey, look at countries that have gun control. Uh, they don't have these problems. Um I don't want to make this a gun control discussion because I think that takes it off topic, but we've got decades now since Columbine of data on how to best approach such a situation. Somebody's actively murdering people. Somebody's actively trying to hurt people. I'm still seeing and talking. I have cops in every class and I ask them questions like, you know, what are you guys working on what do you train and you kind of like it seems like guys that run ranges or run training programs at pds oftentimes like any human they've got something they think's important of course you've got state standards but maybe a guy went to some cool guy class so now it's all about like the sub second draw or somebody else is into shooting b8s at 25 yards you know they got like their shtick um I still hear guys that their active shooter training is the four man diamond. Uh, wait till, mm-hmm. wait till other rescuers arrive and then, you know, make a plan and move. And they're still, that's their best, uh, highest level of training. Why is that when we know that all the data says something different? <sighs> Yeah, in in general, like I picked up this saying decades ago that uh, like my old police department was uh, hundreds of years of tradition unimpeded by progress. Hundreds of years of tradition unimpeded. <laughs> yeah, I got it. That's <clears throat> funny. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I, I deal with stuff, use of force stuff all the time. Like uh, I was talking about an excited delirium case that we had locally with a buddy on text message. And he's a cop at a busy beat up in northern Indiana. Would and, you real quick tell the listeners, until George Floyd, most people didn't know in the public what excited delirium was and even still don't. We tell them what that is for a minute. Well, uh, what, and with George Floyd, wasn't actually an excited delirium case per but, se. But that, that came but, into, the, <clears throat> into the public. You see, you'll, you'll see video. Uh, commonly, you'll see a dude buck naked in public running around making uh you know exorcist noises sweating hypothermia <clears throat> it's a state with uh typically drug induced meth crack cocaine or big drivers uh where you have a dissociative state like they don't even know they're on the same planet with you or their perception of reality is so off uh, sometimes it's a it's the you know some of these drugs like methamphetamine crack cocaine really drive paranoia. Maybe you also have mental health issues and you're self-medicating with street drugs like schizophrenia, 
uh, can be, you can have a paranoid psychotic break with that. Mm. And uh, when the hyperthermia hits because their, their metabolism is in overdrive, a lot of times they'll strip all their clothes off. I've seen uh, literature in some of these cases where, uh, you know, dudes have a body temperature of 112. Uh, oh, that's just like, crazy. You know, absolutely. Yeah, when you when you look at 104, you start to get into you get above 104, you start to get into to brain damage issues, you know. So uh, anyway, I mentioned the, the so excited delirium has been a problem in the police world because cops show up, they think, oh, man, crazy guy. They don't have the right response to it. You end up with the polyester pig pile and then you and dude ends up dead and the cops get the blame for it. Uh, the truth is sometimes you can't save them because they're too far gone. Um, but you know, a lot of times you can mitigate it. So I'm talking about excited delirium and my buddy's like, what's that? And I, and I, I was thinking, how in the hell is a cop in America in the year 2020 not know what excited delirium is? Mm -hmm. uh, and just what you were talking about is cops often or whatever the state standards are, whatever the state academy is, and then follow up in service training is incredibly poor. Uh, it's just not an emphasis because the elective, the, the electors, the, the, the people who elect people, uh, the citizens don't make the training a priority. Um, so uh, when we're looking at like the active shooter thing, somebody might've went to an active shooter or some sort of like state post course, active shooter instructor, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and you just teach what you teach. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you don't step out of people, people, it is not natural for most people to be perpetual students, to be constantly striving to look outside of their own realm, look for better ideas, things like that. I've been to very large departments and I've seen them get in trouble for uh, shoddy use of force programs or shoddy firearms programs because they have what I, I, call uh incest and inbreeding you know like hey mickey uh you know you're you're one of the firearms instructor i'm one of the firearms instructors we have to have some some research hours for the state so you're gonna you're gonna run me through a research i'm gonna run you through a research and then we're recertified mm -hmm. uh, lapd got in big trouble over that with uh the rodney king thing one of the things they got hammered on was uh back then was a failure to train uh, there was a, there's some of their use of force instructors, some of their baton instructors hadn't been recertified in like over a decade. Uh, and you get these departments, not just them, but you get these departments that think, well, we're, you know, whatever, Chicago, NYPD, we're huge, we're big, we're elite. Yeah, not as much as you think you are. Mm -hmm. uh, so it it's surprising to me, it has always been surprising to me how you, you can have a large organization. I'll pick on LAPD again. Like they used to have a reputation as gunfighters. I mean, mm -hmm. all the way down to the street level. They, they had their they had their own guns made after them, like the the Kimber made pistols yeah. just for their just for well, their uh, special investigation guys. You know, and I know some of the guys involved in the program, and I know and they got some good dudes. But for a while there, they had a small cadre of guys, Scotty Reitz, uh, Larry Mudgett, several others that, that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to be doing a disservice, not getting all the names out there, but it was, you got a 10,000 person department. And then you have like, let's say seven, eight dudes by force of personality, driving this program forward into a state of excellence. Well, when those dudes leave, that drive leaves and then people what I, I can tell you what happened to my old job there was a whole lot of yeah we're not going to do that anymore hmm. you know guys that, that just, guys that just didn't like the standard yeah yeah, yeah that's done. well when i started doing when we started doing the post columbine rapid response training uh i had i had cops street cops well i'm not going to do that that's not safe and you gotta you gotta you know this and that and people would hit me with well that's not going to happen here and I thought back, well, we had already had two active shooters in my career before we hit the point we were training for a Columbine event. Don't tell me it can't happen here. We already had two of them. You know, mm -hmm. before I left that job, we'd had four. It's this kind of goes back to what you were talking about with speaking to community leaders. 
And not to go back over that, but we have the cops, the firemen, the street department, et cetera, that we want. And while people say, I don't get to write the training standards, you don't, but the training standards all come from what the public wants at some point. The shit taught in your kids' schools eventually comes down to public opinion. And we hire people that are professionals to say, what should we teach our firemen? What should we teach our 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 road crews for safety? Our you know, whatever. And you can have a a uh, a say so in that. It comes down to money though, right? Like uh I got a friend that after 20 years on our sheriff's office in investigations for child sex crimes, uh, now is back on the road and he hates it because he was playing clothes for years. He didn't, he liked what he was doing because he was good at it. Anyway, <laughs> he had said to me, he's like, some of these guys are training to a standard well below for the road cops, what we did. 20 years ago when he left the road to go into the investigation side of things. And because of unionization, uh, FOP, shit like that, the guys have pushed back even farther on raising standards because, well, are you going to pay me to jog after work to not be a fat ass? Are you going to pay me to, to have a higher shooting qualification? Are you going to pay me to learn and study about physiological things like decide, excited delirium and the answer is like well you gotta better yourself at some time like a mailman's not getting paid to stay fit to walk all day they gotta figure it out if they want to do the job so the 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 other edge to that sword, the double edge to that sword is in very few professions do we expect, and I'm a big believer in it, the vast majority of really good training that I have had, I've paid for myself. I've paid money, bought ammo, took vacation to go to like gun school or sure. uh, SWAT, you know, extra SWAT school, things like that. In very few other professions. So let, let's look at the military. Like you have a, a Navy SEAL or a Green Beret. We don't go to those guys and be like, okay, you're a Navy SEAL. Uh, you're going to have to do, you're going to have to learn halo jumps on your own time. Mm. You no, know, if you want a Navy SEAL, if you want a Green Beret, if you want an Army Ranger, what are you going to do? You want an Army Ranger, you're going to have a selection process. You're going to have Army Ranger school. You're going to teach them all the shit an Army Ranger needs to do. And then you're going to continue to support that training cycle after they get out of school. Yeah. Nobody, there is nobody, not that guys don't do that. Like if I'm a Navy SEAL and maybe I'm going to do take up the hobby of a uh, scuba diving, but there's nobody that said, you know what, uh, if you want to be a Navy SEAL, you're going to have to send yourself to scuba diving certification sure. school and then come back and talk to us. Uh, if you look at Top Gun, because that's, you know, a famous movie, nobody went to those pilots and, and said, you know, you got to train on your own time. So I'm going to buy some time in a Cessna and get some extra flying in so that I'm a more, uh, you know, uh, skilled aviator. Let me, this, let me add something to that though. I've got friends that are Rangers, Green Berets, SEALs. I've got a fr three friends that were top gun pilots. One, a kid I grew up with, uh, went to the air force at, or air force Academy is now a Lieutenant Colonel was an F 15 pilot. I was just with an admiral that ran the whole freaking strike fleet in the Pacific was a F 18 and Tomcat pilot for years. I was with them out at the uh, thing. I was just at in Oklahoma. So I've met these dudes and one thing, and you're like this too. You just said you were uh, my friend, Jack Carr, the author, he was a, uh, a uh, officer in a SEAL team deployed a million times. That dude read everything there was to le read about war, about uh, integrating in other countries to do your job well. They, these guys all trained physical fitness off duty. They all trained uh, various tasks and, and things that supported their job. Pilots. I got a buddy that's uh, a pilot that did in his own time do things to make himself more physically fit so that when in the cockpit in a combat scenario, he would be better uh, at the job, less, less apt to get knocked out from G's and shit like that. So yeah. 
I agree with what you're saying, but then all those guys that excel, you talked about the LAPD guys, excellence. They all exude excellence where they don't want to be the weak link. They're choosing that, okay, I'm, I am this elite guy. I'm the SWAT cop, whatever. I'm going to be the one that's up doing push-ups at home because I'm not going to be the one that lets my buddy or my community down. So that I, I think there's like a mindset component to that too. Well, and I totally agree. But my point is, is that uh, our public has not made that a priority. So let's let's go back to police work. When I first hired on the job, and you and I would think that this is laughable, but like uh, we had a we had a physical fitness test. So you had to do a quarter mile run. I forget what the time hack was, but it, it was a pretty good little sprint for a quarter mile. And then we went to the the other part of the obstacle course. Like you had to be able to do pull ups. There was a four foot wall. There was a six foot wall. There was a, a it was a mock body, like, a, I don't know, hundred pound sandbag, you know, one of them big tube sand things. You had to move it from point A to point B. Uh, you had to take your, you had to take the revolver and I forget how many trigger pulls, but you had to be able to pull the trigger with the uh, K frame revolver. Double like, action. Uh, dang, 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 dang. Yeah. Double action. And it was like, uh, I don't know, like 30 trigger pulls in one minute. Uh, oh, that hurts with, my hand just thinking about it. Well, with, with both hands. So you had to be able to do it with both hands. So uh, all we had to be <laughs> able to do. thinking about dudes sitting there doing that. My forearm's on fire. Uh, keep going. Uh, but like uh, you only had to do two pull-ups, two dead hang pull-ups. Okay that in the six foot wall so you know the run you see this like police obstacle police shows obstacle course like in the academy you run up most people will hook that throw a foot you get over there well that's what kept most females off the job was two pull-ups and a six foot wall so the argument in all these lawsuits was that's not a realistic uh, job standard and I've seen it argued in court and I've seen the wall taken out of selection processes because, well, nobody actually does that. I used to jump fences all the time and other people didn't. You know why? Because they got a, they got a fat ass and they couldn't and they couldn't, didn't keep their standards up. So I don't know how many times I got stuck like on the wrong side of a fence by myself because I had other people that couldn't do it. Didn't come uh, over with you. All yeah, of a sudden they, they couldn't get over the fence. So the idea will, you know, well, just because people that should be doing it aren't doing it doesn't mean it's not a job related standard. We haven't done that with the Navy SEALs or the, the you know, we're okay with, you know, you look at all these elite units, what's the selection process, like 90% attrition rate where people fall out. We've, we've done this, the opposite in the police world. Well, we can't get rid of this person. We can't get rid of that person. We can't get rid of this person because they're five foot two and like, you know, 200 pounds, et cetera. It's like the, the training, a lot of, I hear a lot of people joke about uh, no cop left behind training. And it's absolutely true. We've lowered the standards. There's departments now that can't find people. Uh, talk about ignoring uh, history. Uh, Miami in the 80s had a big recruiting problem and they fast-tracked people through the selection process and short changed a lot of their background checks. And then all of a sudden they started finding uh, problems with, hey, why is this dead guy with a bullet in his head floating in the canal with a <laughs> you on it? Oh, no. You know, this dope house is getting ripped. Uh, this murder for hire happens. This bank robbery happens. And it was Miami cops doing it. And then they got this big scandal and they got to clean it all up. We are back to those days where they are watering down the written test or the written test is racist or the the physical fitness test is sexist or what I've seen departments do away completely with a physical fitness test of any kind. Uh, the whole trigger pull thing, that's supposed to be sexist. Uh, but what we find is a, a huge predictor we find from sources like Foresight's Research Center, huge predictor of if you can't pull the trigger like, let's say you buy one of those reset, you know, the, the red handle Glocks where you can click, 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 mm -hmm. click, click. If you can't forget the numbers, but if you can't do that, let's say 30 times in a row with each hand, 
they can put the data to the fact that you're going to have a lot of trouble just qualifying to a basic minimum level because hence, you know, as a society, we're deteriorating. Uh, I got some education and hand strength stuff when uh, I was fighting some carpal tunnel issues. But today, nowadays, the average college dude has the grip strength of the average college chick from the 1980s. I believe it. There's a great study. Paul Sharp and I uh, reference it often, but the uh, a person his ability to hang and hold their own body weight, just hang is a predictor of longevity. And people say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Because it means that you have some general level of fitness. There's another study that was done, your ability to get up off of the floor, off your back without using your hands or using only one limb instead of two is a predictor of longevity. And somebody that has to like turn on all fours and climb up something, you know, like that person's probably not going to live that long. There's some cool studies on that stuff, but I joke with students, guys, I meet, we have all these jobs now that we get to just play with phones and keyboards and yeah. I'm not digging on anybody. I grew up milking goats, uh, mucking stalls, splitting wood, running chainsaws, doing that kind of stuff as a, as a young, a carpenter apprentice, humping wood up and down ladders. And so just byproduct of it, of that is you get stronger and I'll see guys in class and they go, how the f hold the gun like that? Like I did a class with you shooting that you did your course with the pocket guns yeah. and guys go, how do you hold the gun like that? And I, I look at their hand, I go, well, you have vaginal hand syndrome from years of typing and filing your nails and there's nothing wrong with that but you can't expect to you can't expect to do something when for 30 or 40 years of life you've not forced your hands to do to do things like that i don't want to i don't want to derail the conversation it kind of goes back again though to like what do we want out of policemen my great grandfather was a, a chicago copper irishman he was a racist from what i'm told i didn't meet him uh, I did meet him, but I, he passed when I was a three, four year old kid. I call him a racist lightly, uh, but in the sense of what the way he acted would probably have him on the front cover of the newspapers now. Uh, old Irishman with the Irish accent, et cetera. Um, he was there when Dillinger was shot. Mm -hmm. I would read through his uh, his handwritten notes. We had boxes of them. I don't know where they're at now, but the stuff that he would read in his notes from like his work was comical. Like, uh, got a call from Mrs. O'Leary. Old Danny was giving her the what for. Her. So after we saw the blood around her eye, I took him around back and smacked him around some and sent him to the pub to chill out. Like, like some guy was beating his wife. So you slapped him around and sent him to the bar. And that was, that was him doing his job or like some boys stole some shit. So they took the strap to him and beat the snot out of some kids out in front of a store. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's right, but that's what people wanted from cops. Then now yeah. we, now you gotta be a, a therapist, a tire changer an EMT. You gotta be able to, to, run into a building and be freaking diehard ready to go all times super soldier it's weird i think uh so kind of a you know an idea that i stole from mike brown um was it i think we got police work all wrong and you look at we we want when we have these emergencies we have things that go bad on the street we have uh all these incidents like taser failure turns into a shooting like the, you know, the deal that, that burned down Atlanta, uh, this deal, you know, the first responders at the school shooting, et cetera, et cetera. That's all your frontline street level cops. Well, how do we treat our frontline street level cops? If you look at the movies, all the cool guys are detectives, all, you know, everything is about, and uh, our society expects that, the guys on the street working patrol are just like these moron peons. And then all the cool guys are detectives or plain clothes or narcs or whatever. They're CSI, you know, they walk around in uh, you know, designer jeans with, you know, their little holster and, and, Oh, we're not the cops or the, we're the CSI. Everything about 
the culture of that and the idea of that bashes on the street cops. And what do you do like in the movies, like in, a, in, in Lethal Weapon, when Danny Glover and uh, Mel Gibson were being punished, what did they do to him? We're going to put you back in patrol. That That's the attitude. We got it all backwards. We should hire people and run them through these specialty units. Like you're going to work crime scene, learn how to work a crime scene. You could any, a lot of people could work detectives. You can interview people, uh, run down paperwork, stuff like that. It's actually not very exciting. It's really mundane. I think the flip side should be that you promote to and you aspire to, we select for the most elite cops we can find get to work patrol. That makes sense. So when your people, your experienced, fit, trained uh, people with a, with a good head on their, their shoulders that we know can work under pressure uh, because they've been to like SWAT school and, you know, things like that, then, then they get to aspire to handling these problems on the street where the shit goes sideways within seconds. And we need cool heads and we need good decisions and we need right now there's no no, I, I don't know of any department where there is any, any incentive whatsoever to be an experienced, cool, calm, a veteran street cop. Everybody wants to get a promotion and a pay raise and get away from the schedule. Like I'm forced to work weekends. I'm forced to work nights, uh, rotating days off. You know, I've been up all night. Now I got to go to court, uh, that kind of stuff. They're the lowest paid and the most abused. And then uh, we set it up to where everybody wants to get away from it. And then we don't train them because we've already established that. And then we're shocked and amazed that when they have an incident that they haven't been, they haven't <laughs> done the training and experience to handle that they f it's absolute lunacy when you actually you break it down like that. Yeah, it, man. It, it, it's, you know, when, if we were, you know, what we're doing is a functional equivalent, go back to the military model. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. You're going to go, uh, you, you, you have something that's going to happen. And instead of sending Delta or the SEALs to go kill Osama bin Laden, you're going to go send private Joe Snuffy and a bunch of guys straight out of basic training. You know, it, it's ludicrous when you think about it that way. I kind of think a lot about medical stuff. I'm an EMT. You've, you've got a background in that, too. Nobody would want an ambulance to pull up, excuse me, <clears throat> an ambulance to pull up when their loved one was sick or hurt and somebody was on the ambulance that didn't have a proficiency in CPR and in, and in doing all of the things that are required to safely get that person from wherever they are to a higher level of care alive. You don't want, <coughs> oh yeah, well, like at my EMT or paramedic school, we don't work on taking vitals. That's just not something we have time to do, or we don't, we don't administer any drug. No O2. We don't do uh, backboards. Nope. Don't need them. We'll leave that. Like it just stop talking about really basic stuff. Of course, <clears throat> I got a tickle in my throat, but we didn't, we would never expect those things. But then in this one sector of public service, we just assume people figure shit out on the fly. And you said for science Institute for science Institute, all their work in talking about human stress responses, we also assume that people, when they put a badge on, just no longer have physiological responses to stress. And you just got to always do the right thing and be perfectly calm and, and collected. And me, a normal average Joe, I, I don't have to worry about that, but you do. Well, we have a, yeah, we, we, we don't expect our cops to be human. Uh, and we often send our youngest and least experienced, least trained cops into these like you know, day-to-day -day things, domestic disturbances, whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, and then we're surprised when they have an emotional response, but then we also, mm -hmm. most places don't train for, and they don't select for. When I was one of the supervisors on the SWAT team, we had a week with our recruits. We did a whole week of simunitions. We used to, uh, we, you know, my old job when I was running it, we would run people through simunition scenarios and they had like, inert spray and the, the foam batons and things like that. And it wasn't just shoot, don't shoot decision-making. It's do I talk to this guy? Do I spray him with the spray? Do I hit him with a baton? 
what would do I escalate? Do I de-escalate? Uh, we would have school shooter scenarios. We would have domestic disturbances, car stops, all this stuff. And we would actually record a lot of this. And a lot of it was use of force decision making. And uh, there were people we cut, like they did not graduate the academy. They, they were fired because they didn't they couldn't make good use of force decisions in a training simulated environment. Hmm. Uh, we had one young lady I was involved in a complaint for, uh, you know, sexual discrimination. She was going to sue the department, things like that. But we could document every single scenario she was in. She killed everybody. Once she got stressed, she'd pull her SIM gun out and start shooting people like 100% of the time. Uh, people often think that, you know, like a tackleberry type big doofus dude would be somebody that do that. This was a slight female that, uh, she'd get wound up, start shooting people. You know, we had one domestic uh, scenario where, uh, there was two halves of the domestic. So it's common for officers talking to one half and other officers talking to the other half. Well, the officer she was partnered up with, uh, his bad guy or role player ended up having a gun. So he sees the gun and yells out the common cop thing gun and starts pulling his gun to address this, this role player with the gun. Well, she hears her partner yell gun and pulls out her gun and shoots her role player. Damn. And afterwards when we're doing the debrief, cause we always do a little debrief. What, why, why did you shoot this guy? Well, I heard my partner yell gun you did what? Uh, so we documented, we ended up getting rid of her. We had to, we had to weather some complaints, um, and some threats of lawsuits and things like that. But the way, the way things are set up nowadays, my, my understanding at my old job, they wouldn't fire that guy. Well, we can't get rid of people, uh, for not passing this program here. That's bizarre. We had Rob high on from CCW safe, Oklahoma city copper who, uh, ran part of their academy for a while and he was talking about uh recruits that they could not elicit a survival response and <clears throat> stressing them and these people basically would turtle up or not fight back like and they'd have to let them go like i i can't do anything to make you want to win or fight or live which means i don't want you to die or let somebody else die because you can't do that like I can teach you, but I can't make you. And that is a strange thing. Like nowadays, I got a friend that was an elected sheriff for years down in a, uh, the city's Dothan, Alabama. I think it's uh, Houston County, Alabama is where I've, it is. Uh, I've lived there, actually. Have uh, you? Yeah. Andy, Andy Hughes, Sheriff Andy Hughes. His that was a... Uh... That was in the 60s, though, when my dad was assigned to Fort Rucker. So um, he worked at Fort Rucker for a while, and his father was the police chief, I think, of Dothan. So in those days, <laughs> Andy's like 6'5", 250, 260 pounds. He was a power lifter, just like a big, intimidating dude. Very skilled. The Department of Homeland Security uh, coaxed him out of the job as sheriff to to run all tactical operations for the state of Alabama for Department of Homeland Security and stand up like a statewide mm -hmm. tag team. <clears throat> My point in bringing him up is he talks often about we're more concerned about running things like uh, credit checks on potential hires, which I know is an indicator of somebody's honor and integrity and stuff. But we're more concerned about like a credit check than the person's ability to get punched in the face and keep fighting or yeah. put put hands on somebody. And uh, it's it, it, I mean, I think it's multifaceted, though, right? The litigious nature of society. Uh, it, you do anything now and somebody's taking a picture of you so that they can make fun of you or sue you and how do we this is a broad question how do we how do we change that i think i want to bring it full circle back to where we began just like hit the key points 
of course, this is not something you guys listening should take as like, okay, I now heard this. I'm good to go, go seek training, but somebody's actively murdering people. Like what's the best course of action according to legendary lawman, Chuck Haggard. And of course I know this is a broad stroke. There's a million things in a dynamic situation that change factors. Well, and, and I'll go back to the, you know, my analogy of the old, uh, the idea of having an emergency response team or some sort of a emergency response to uh, a hostage, say you got a hostage job. Okay. It's kind of stabilized. We've got a couple of guys here. If it goes sideways, we're going to have to breach and go with just a couple of guys or three or four guys or whatever, which we don't have the whole tag team here. We would prefer to have negotiators and SWAT and everything else, but you go with the resources you have because lives, lives are in peril. Um, there is no time to wait for some of these things. We have immediate threat to life, human safety. Uh, so, you know, truthfully, if I show up, if I have a, a, impetus I, I can hear gunfire uh people screaming people running things like that you move to contact to it as as quickly as you can however you have to do that it may be like you're trying to get into a school and the doors are locked uh you know uh we have talked about breaching shooting locks emergency breaching with shotguns driving your car through the door uh whatever it takes to do that and aggressively moving to contact so that you can put tactical pressure on that person. Um, my belief is, is that, and it, you look at the history of it, the vast majority of successful interdictions that caused a lower body count have been by solo operators or pressing as fast as possible and outside of this like posse team con construct that so many people train under. Um, in order to do that, you're going to have to have some level of physical fitness and some level of shooting ability, and you're going to have have to have some level of eye of the tiger to have the will to take the fight to the bad guy. And if you don't have all those ingredients, then you're going to have people standing around wondering what to do, uh, you know, taking cover, not wanting to take action, that sort of thing. You can't does, go ahead. I would say you can't. And like my old job, we had a, the psych test for a while. Uh, you know how they you can do like profile serial killers um like the fbi will profile a serial killer well they did a psych profile uh this one company did a psych profile of the average marine corps private and then they came up with a psych test to weed that guy out so you're deselecting aggressiveness in your cops and then you are shocked and amazed when you have people that won't aggressively press a fight on a guy that's killing kids um that's kind of problematic, you know? What I was about to ask, you said eye of the tiger. Do you think people can develop that uh, on their own? Is it something that's born into them? Is it something that is somewhat? Yes. Yeah. There, we, we know from, from looking at combatives, uh, you know, martial arts, jujitsu, whatever, whatever uh, you can, you can take, if you got, if you got the raw material that's sufficient, um, you know, if somebody has the the intellect for it, they have the physical attributes, uh, et cetera, um, you can you can develop the raw material and get people to that point. Uh, but I think, you know, we don't select for there's people that shouldn't be in law enforcement because they don't have the ability to apply deadly force or they fold up under pressure. Mm. Uh, a lot of these a lot of these bad use of force incidents I've seen are the people who have been under under pressure. Uh, they didn't have the raw material to they could develop to that level. And to steal a term from the canine word, they were a fear biter. Uh, you Ooh. know that. Um, so not at, we already know, like, let's say Navy SEALs or Green Berets. What's the attrition rate in this selection process? Better than 90 percent. Right. So not everybody can do that we're not selecting like that for police work anymore. The basic raw material, do you have the psyche? Do you have the intelligence? Do you have the ability to work under duress? Not all human beings can work under duress. We know fight or flight response is a thing, but it's more complicated than that. Fight, flight, surrender, freeze, posture are all things. And if you're somebody that's prone to go deer in the headlights under pressure, it doesn't make you a bad person, but it just means you shouldn't be a cop 
or a soldier or a fighter pilot, you know? That makes good sense. So what I heard there is we, the people, need to do a better job of creating requirements for who we hire based on what it is we want them to do for us. And then those of you that want to go get that job, sit down and figure out who the f- you are and if you have what it takes otherwise you're going to have the world scream at you if you don't do the job that they hired you to do and you got to go to bed at night well that's it's part of that i used to have a talk with my rookies about you have to be able, like we know you have to be able to use deadly force at times and it has to be righteous when you do it uh you can't get emotionally involved in <clears throat> people's asses and use excessive force and things like that not everybody is cut out for everything I'm not a nuclear physicist, right? My, my intellect, my gifts are not there. Uh, and I used to talk about like, um, you know, uh, my mom, love my mom. She was a saintly woman. You look at like uh, Mother Teresa, uh, the Pope. You can think of a lot of other people. Uh, like Mother Teresa was a wonderful, wonderful, warm human being who helped to make the world a better place by her diligent efforts throughout her entire life. You know what else I could say about her? Probably she'd make a shitty street cop. Mm. Doesn't make you a bad person. Just means you, you're not, you know, you're not where your attributes uh, would, would should lead you to be. And I see in police work, there's a whole lot of um, there are, there are the, Oh, uh, you know, I can be an astronaut and I can be a police officer and you know, people that really have no business being involved in some of that. Makes sense. That's, It's um, not a big deal to try to be a baker or a lawyer if you're not good at it. You can suck at that. But if you're doing something that people are expecting you to do your job so that others will live, that's maybe something that we need to be more judicious as ourselves as we pick those things. I've met people that were cops for six months or a year and realized this sucks or, and, I, and I've never done that job. I don't want to. Um, personally, I don't like working for somebody. I don't like working on, 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 uh, on nights and weekends and stuff. That's not, that's not really the way my brain likes to work, but I appreciate those that do, but I've seen people come into those positions and then, and then quickly head out of them because they realized that they weren't cut out for it. Probably better to do that than have somebody die because you didn't do your job. Yeah, we had a we had a dude in the academy one time that uh, some of the guys were talking crap on. And you're about halfway through the academy. It's firearms week, and uh, back then we issued 5906s. But uh, you got the the big plastic blue Smith and Wesson box, and everybody's good. It's it's a recruit academy. Everybody's getting a brand new gun. So uh, our range master, I was helping him out at the time. He's in the classroom with the big long classroom table, so everybody's got their own chair. And uh, he's laying a box in front of each officer because he's already logged the serial number. Like uh, Officer Smith is getting gun 123. So he's going through his list and he's setting the box down in front of the people. And he slides the box across the table at dude. And dude looks at it and slides it back away from him, back towards the range master. And the range master catches that and he pushes it back to him. And the guy looks at it because the box is open, the gun's right there. And he pushes it away again. And then later that day, he goes and has a talk with the uh, the, the training sergeant, who was a separate job, like kind of an administrative co- training coordinator. Uh, and he self-selected. It didn't dawn on him to that point that he may be called upon to utilize deadly force at some point. And he's staring at the gun and realized, I can't do that. And he ended up leaving. And people, there were people like, oh, do would you no, he did the right thing. And I know there were people who should have done the right thing and like self-selected and found a different career field who didn't, who were on what Pat what Pat Rogers used to call blue welfare. Um, they had no business being on the job. They're sucking up a, a slot and a paycheck. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not going to disparage anybody. You know, it's common in our society for to, to disparage honest work. Like, oh, you want fries for, with that? You know what? If I pull up to the drive-through 
and I got nobody there to give me my hamburger or my fries, I'm having a bad day. You know, mm-hmm. we, we, dispar- we disparage honest work. Uh, and I think that's bullshit. And we disparage people's, we disparage people's uh, decisions along that line. You know, I wasn't going to talk shit on that guy because he made the right decision and, and it, it was a brave one to make, uh, you know. I like that. That's a, I think that's a good takeaway for everybody listening. Not everybody's cut out to do what you do or another job. Uh, Caddyshack, what the judge say? The world needs ditch diggers too. And I'm not, I mean, I've done plenty of digging of holes and, and emptying the trash cans. I clean work for a job, a job in high school where we go into a building and clean all the toilets and mop all the floors. I have no issue with any of that kind of work, but um, like you said, everybody wants to be the, the SWAT guy or the super soldier, but somebody has got to go out and direct traffic and pull over the drunk drivers. And, and that, that is the job that maybe we have the wrong viewpoint, uh, and we've attached the wrong value to it. And maybe that's why we're not as a society instilling kind of like teachers, like I, you, everybody has heard everything you need to learn. You learned in kindergarten or first grade. And it's so true, right? Be nice, share, et cetera, pay attention. <clears throat> why are we not? And then people that do that job, you meet people that are kindergarten, first grade teachers. Oftentimes they're the lowest paid. They're the ones that are having to like buy stuff for the students because yeah. it's not a budget. And they're using their $30,000 salary to buy crayons or whatever the shit they need. Like that's the same kind of thing. Maybe it should be the other way around. Maybe that teacher that's got the first graders or the kindergartner should be the one with the biggest budget, with the most things that, that are available, just like the street cop. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree. I dig that. All right. So the synopsis is have the tools, know how to use them, go now. And then uh, I think it was Bear Bryant, might have been somebody else. The will to win means nothing without the will to prepare to win. Uh, I think departments should be training their cops. That I we've already talked about that budgets, things like that. In the short term, me ranting about that isn't going to fix the problem. If you're on the job, keep yourself physically fit, keep yourself technically and tactically proficient. If you don't take care of you, and I realized this 35 years ago, if I didn't up my training, because my training when I went through a crew academy was awful. We just made stuff up and we cowboyed shit. And we had to write down, man, that was a bad idea. Uh, right now, and Greg Elifritz has talked about this. If you screw something up, your job is going to throw you under the bus. You, the only person you can count on to take care of you is you. That whole uh, be your own cal- cavalry, be your own bodyguard in the police world. Uh, you have to own your training resume. You got to be technically and tactically proficient. It behooves you to maintain that. And then, uh, I forget the Winston Churchill saying about, uh, you know, everybody's called upon to, uh, you know, you may, may, you may have a great moment in your life uh, where they're, they're figuratively tapped on the shoulder and selected to do great things. And what a tragedy it would be to not be ready to do those things when you're called upon to do them. Uh, I, I don't, I can't imagine I can't imagine standing around outside of an elementary school with kids bleeding and kids getting shot and doing nothing about it because I don't have the the tools or the tactics or the training that I have invested in myself to make sure that I can do that. Uh, So in the short term, I'll tell all the cops out there, you know, I will shame them into, you know, do it, do what you got to do to take care of business. And then the departments and the voters, the elected officials, they need to fix that bullshit because this paradigm is really screwed up. After um, Colonel Grossman kind of became popular the last 20 years, <clears throat> all of his warrior mindset training that he did around the country. Now it's like the other way where you've got, uh, was it Minneapolis? They banned warrior training. Like, I don't know how you ban that. Like, like 
No, you can't. Like, I don't even know like how you codify that. That means that means no officers will do physical fitness, martial arts, you know, gunplay. Well, I mean, that's just so stupid. But for those of you listening, if you don't know who uh, Grossman is, check him out. He wrote several books on combat. Uh, what were some of the other ones? On combat, on killing, or his two big ones. Yeah, and basically he <clears throat> dissects in his words. I know there's some of his stuff is controversial uh, to certain people and sex of society not the point though is that it became pretty widely adopted a lot of his methodologies and mindset on on developing uh protectors and now based on everything we've talked about in this podcast you've got communities saying that we don't want that now we want now we want mental health experts with with tasers and pepper spray and the ability to magically make people stop doing psychotic shit. Yeah. That's, I don't even think it's a pendulum. Like people go, people like flippantly say like, ah, the pendulum will swing back. I don't even think it's a pendulum. I just think it's a bunch of crazy shit. People screaming and like, it's not like, is, I don't know if there is a middle or, or, or it's a, it sure seems societal bipolarism or something like that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. All, all I know, I challenged people yesterday. You said something that made me think about it. But think about who it is. I tell this to every student as we're training. If somebody was coming to tr- save your family, do you want them to be accurate, proficient, calm, able to communicate well what skills would you want that person that burst through the door of your house when a madman was there or what skills as you were in a car wreck do you want the rescuers to have and of course we can't learn everything but just what do you want and now learn that shit and be good at it and if if you're a cop you should do that people get pissed at me all the time and they say you don't do the job and i say the same thing that i say when i get pulled over i pay your bills I'm just kidding. I don't say that, but I mean, it is true, right? You're swearing an oath to the community, but you're, you're also saying, send me, I'll do it. I'll, I'll stand in the breach for the kids, for the fricking people that can't do it themselves. I'll rush into the fire. I'll rush into the bullets. And that's, you're saying it. So if you're saying it and I'm not, I'm not uh, including myself in that. Cause I, I don't do that job. Do it, prepare yourself like you said, well, to do it. Yeah. You, you train people, people can hire you to come train them. Your company is agile training, correct? Agile training and consulting. And yeah. Consulting. Uh, the, so my, my website, my domain name, uh, you, you can only have the domain that, uh, you know, the, the internet gods will sell you. So it's agile tactical.com. Uh, cause agile training, somebody already took it, you know, um, but yeah, agile training and consulting. Let me, re- let me, let me fit, correct your sentence. It's not the internet gods. You just didn't buy it fast enough. Well, somebody got there first, you know? So if somebody hooks up with you, you will consult with them on some of the things we've talked about as well. You will travel or they can come to you to do various courses. Yeah. Um, so as you know, like, I got some specialty stuff that I don't think a lot of other people are doing or anybody else is doing. Uh, my small pistol skills class. I don't really see anybody else doing that. Uh, I, I do some specialty stuff or revolver work, things like that. I do a lot of what other people do. Some sort of what you would think of as combative pistol. Uh, everybody does carbine nowadays. Uh, I can look back and, and be like, man, I've been using AR 15s for 41 years now. Um, so I got, I got a little bit of, uh, got a little bit of experience with them, but, uh, like my, my OC instructor course that I do for non-cops, as far as I know, I'm the only non-manufacturer affiliated OC course out there. That's not a law enforcement course. I, I don't think anybody else is doing one. I still got to get one of those set up with you so that we can get some people up here spun up on spraying people with hot peppery juices i just uh, i just did an le course on that yesterday in kansas city because uh, I, I do that as well 
But uh, other things I do, like expert witness work, uh, uh, I've, I've been involved in. A lot of it has been defending cops, but I've also defended private citizens, defended security guard against uh, uh, excessive force case. Weirdly enough, I once got utilized as an expert witness on a murder case hmm. on the defense, which was a weird place for me to be, uh, being a cop. But it was the right thing to do. I, I took the case because it was one of those Travis East of Justice uh, type of thing. Self-defense situation? Uh, no, it was actually an accidental discharge. It was just tragic as hell. Oh, wow. uh, and Army Army buddy, they were drinking. Somebody was passing a gun around. Look how cool my 1911 is. Nobody unloaded it. Oh. Uh, one one guy shot his, uh, his, his best friend. Uh, they were uh, Iraq veterans together, but he was being prosecuted for first degree murder. Oh, wow. Which means that he intentionally. Yeah. Yeah. Intentionally with a forethought, malice, et cetera. You know, it was, it was vastly overcharged. It was, it was just absolutely ludicrous that, that they went to that, especially how tragic it was. Um, you know, anyway, it was the right thing to do. So, uh, you know, I do expert witness work. I do uh, training consulting, policy consulting, and I still, you know, I do low light training, active shooter. Uh, I've done quite a bit of training with, uh, say you can't be armed, you're a teacher. There's an art to locking down your classroom so it's effectively locked down. We look at lockdown failures, uh, like what the uh, librarian at Columbine tried to do didn't work, and then all those kids get killed in the library. So uh, I do training for people that can be armed. I, get, I do training for people that can't be armed, uh, work with police departments. I've done training. Uh, one of my friends, Warren Wilson, brought me down to uh, Oklahoma and, and, and Enid because they're pretty progressive. And I taught a solo responder class uh, for their police department, you know, um, which was really cool that they brought me in for that. That's awesome. I look forward to having you up. I hope to see you again sometime soon. Uh, I drive through your neck of the woods all the time. I'll have to look at your calendar and jump in another one of your classes. I appreciate you coming on today and sharing some of your, your thoughts and life experiences and, and uh, giving people something to think about. If nobody uh, that is on here today ever runs into you, let me rephrase that. If the people on here never run into you, if they never pass your way, if they never talk to you again, what would you leave them with? <clears throat> I think I think a couple of things we talked about is, uh, you know, be the lack of bullshit you want to see in the world. Uh, hold yourself accountable. Do the work, you know, like Paul Sharp likes to say, don't talk about it, be about it mm. uh, kind of thing. For the cops out there, you're going to have to handle your business. You're going to have to take care of your own life, training, tactical, uh, you know, be tactically proficient, physically fit, things like that. You go into emergency services, you lose the right to be out of shape or, you know, incompetent, that sort of thing. Uh, and then if you if you're not if you're not in emergency services, uh you know, if I ask you the question, have you emphasized to your elected officials that, that you want to emphasize highly trained emergency responders, don't be the next guy that tells me, no, I've never bothered to do that. Um, and then, uh, the you know, the bigger picture thing we talked about, the, the just complete free of the Internet and the news cycle and the misinformation and and, uh, you know, you you can't get the story and four hours, 24 hours, 48 hours. It, it's just not going to be accurate. And then, um, so, I mean, just stop buying into that bullshit. Mm -hmm. I dig it. I dig it. A lot of uh, personal accountability stuff is what you're saying. Be a good American. Be a good citizen. You know, you remember, remember uh, Saving Private Ryan when he said, earn this? You know, we're we're we are riding on the backs of giants, you know, and it's not just Washington and Jefferson and Lincoln. And, you know, we got guys like Audie Murphy and Sergeant York. And, you know, we 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 are blessed to live in the society and the nation that we live in with the standard of living we have because it's all been passed down to us. Mm -hmm. And now what do we want? Bread and circuses, mm -hmm. you know, earn earn this, earn it. I dig it. Yeah, I think about that stuff often as I travel around <clears throat> on these beautiful roads 
tunnels cut through mountains that dudes did with dynamite and pickaxes and like go see hoover dam or any of these like great things that we built were like dudes were out there drinking water out of buckets and shit eating eating, like there's no there's no fancy air-conditioned job site trailers and stuff these guys were just out there the roads all across this country were just built with like pretty rugged equipment and rugged Mm -hmm. men and we get to enjoy all of that (laughs) yeah now we get stuff zipped around on super highways so that we have fresh grapes in the frozen winter of the northlands no matter what time of year it is and bananas in january even though bananas don't even grow in this country do they no but i i'm with you you guys that have watched go check chuck out online uh what is your uh handle on you got an instagram page i do believe yeah it's it's chuck haggard chuck haggard is there an underscore in there i think man i gotta look uh I think it's Chuck underscore Haggard. I thought there was. Um, H-A-G-G-A-R-D. Yes. I think you should change that to Legendary Lawman. Just to... Chuck uh, Chuck underscore Haggard. There you go. You can check him out. He posts some stuff from time to time. I know there's also a way to get a hold of him there through the DMs because we DM each other often there. Be well. Don't be dickheads. If the stuff's important to you, pay attention. Talk to the people in your community. Maybe you yourself want to run for one of those offices and you can inject and and make some change for the better. If you dug this podcast, share it. Leave some comments in the comment section. Don't be dickheads. Bye now. Visit our website, kerrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Kerry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at kerrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at kerrytrainer.com or kerrytrainer.com. doing in the podcast room steve i'm writing a national anthem it's going to be at folk festivals for gunfighter gun oil oh. let me tell you about gunfighter gun hire It wasn't even Bob Dylan. It was like a, it was like a love story. <laughs> <laughs>